Thank you, Alexei, for your introduction. And uh, it is a great honor to me to be here today to present uh, the insights I got from my research uh, on this uh, doctoral school. And actually, several years ago, I myself was a participant of a doctoral school as a doctoral student. And uh, now um, I'm really glad to be able to share uh, my insights that I got during my research. And actually, as Alexei mentioned, I come uh, from psychology. I'm, I got my education in psychology and then social psychology and started writing my PhD thesis in the sphere of psychology. But then uh, when I got fascinated by the topic of internally displacement, I understood that uh, this topic should be explored explored more broad and uh, thus I turned uh, a bit more to urban anthropology, human geography and peace studies and make this uh, interdisciplinary research. And uh, actually uh, starting uh, my research about internal displacement, I wasn't planning to go deep into the decommunization issue, but uh, it was one of the many aspects that I found out during my research. And so um, after I had very fruitful uh, conversation interviews with my informants, uh, I started thinking about the communization issue and the relation of the communization to identities, to spatial identities uh, of internally displaced people. And uh, so I made this bottom-up approach from the uh, daily lived experiences of internally displaced people up to stereotyping about uh, decommunization in Ukraine in general. And uh, uh, the presentation, I'm the, my talk today uh, will be based on the uh, recent papers that I published this year in the Nationalities Papers, uh, but with more pictures and background information. So I'll share my screen. Um, is it working? Looks like it is working. Yes. So, uh, perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So, uh, decommunization in Ukraine. What do we think about when we say this word decommunization in Ukraine? What happens if you Google decommunization in Ukraine? Of course, uh, this is the most um, widely spread image, uh, an event that happened in Kyiv in early December 2013 during the events of Euromaidan when the protesters uh, um, marched from Independence Square where they gathered to the Lenin Monument in the end of Khrushchev Square where the monument to Lenin, Lenin Monument was still standing and demolished this monument. This action, this uh, very act of collective action of demolishing this monument turned out to be a very symbolic moment, a symbolic turn from the Soviet past to creating a new uh, Ukrainian identity whenever it should be. Uh, but um, this uh, um, turning down the monuments uh, might be a little and decommunization itself in Ukraine and uh, turning down the monuments as a very way of manifestation uh, of turning from one political regime to another has uh, a bit longer tradition in Ukraine. For instance, this is an illustration from, uh, I think, 1917, uh, when uh, the previous Ukrainian, pre-Soviet Ukrainian revolution happened. And this is uh, almost the same uh, place uh, where the Lenin monument destruction happened. It is a demolition of a monument to Stalipin, uh, the minister of the Tsar regime who was assassinated in Kyiv. And uh, uh, this uh, picture was taken when the Ukrainian National Republic's voluntary army uh, took Kyiv and uh, it was there symbolic action of proclamation they write to this space and establishing something new uh, and new narrative for Ukrainian state. Uh, so uh, today's presentation will not only focus on the monuments. Uh, meanwhile, it can be seen as one of the brightest illustrations of what happens with the communization in Ukraine. But I will also focus on some theoretical aspects like uh, writing a new national biography for Ukraine. I will also go 
deeper in history of decommunization and in particular the waves of decommunization in Ukraine. After that, we'll uh, talk briefly about decommunization in Donbass region from where the internal displaced people come. Uh, then uh, in the second part of my presentation, I will also focus on the experiences of internal displaced people. And as a conclusion, uh, we'll try to think where do we go from here? What can we do with our decommunization process? Where, what is our situation now? And uh, what else can be done in this very complicated process in Ukraine? Uh, so to start with, um, uh, one moment. Okay, uh, to start with, um, one of the main concepts that I applied uh, during this my uh, research insight into decommunization is in Ukraine is the concept of national biography introduced by Felix Beren Scotter in his uh, studies. And as Beren Scotter points out, a generalized narrative about the state, uh, its history, present condition, and aspiration for the future may take the form of a national biography, a very simplified abstraction that is easy to perceive and easy to communicate that um, actually um, explains what a nation is from where it comes from, from what's its aspiration and so on. And creation of such a national biography implies uh, both a selection of the useful historical events and of their interpretation in order to create a story that will fit the chosen agenda and politics and facilitate the identification process of the members uh, with an imagined community of the nation in uh, Benedict Anderson's terms. And so uh, there is a broad range of research uh, about the switch in national narrative in Ukraine in 2014, 2015 as the aftermath of Euromaidan revolution. Uh, but uh, I might say that this switch that happens in recent year is both the reaction to the political events and the outbreak of the war, as well as a continuation of the process that uh, started yeah, 30 years ago with Ukraine gaining independence, but was not completed yet and still is not completed. Um, works right uh, so uh, on uh, today's level situation what do we have today is uh, since uh, 2015 uh, is that a declaration of uh, the need to create a new national biography for Ukraine and to rewrite the national narrative is established on a state level and uh, we have a special uh, governmental agency called uh, um, the Ukrainian Institute for National Memory that is directly responsible for writing uh, this, for creating this new national narrative, national biography of Ukraine and uh, yeah, it is responsible for creation of uh, a new national identity for the state and for people. And uh, herein, uh, the issue of decommunization was declared uh, in 2015 as inseparable from the matters of security, national narrative, and national identity. And uh, decommunization itself is seen by Institute of National Memory as a matter of culture. So the process is to be carried out through the renaming of place names, the rem removal of communist era monuments, and by altering the meaning of remembered dates. And uh, also this process is inextricably linked with the process of collective memory, but I will not stop on this point because unfortunately we have a little limited time. So I will uh, switch here to the waves of decommunization and to history of decommunization in Ukraine with a particular focus on the spatial aspect of decommunization because uh, the very issue of decommunization is much broader than just renaming the place names. But unfortunately in uh, contemporary Ukraine, not on academic, but on a public level, decommunization is often perceived only as a uh, demolition of monuments and renaming the streets. And I will come back to this thesis a bit later. So waves of decommunization, when it started. Uh, I would define that the first wave of decommunization uh, happened in early 1990s. And 
and had also some traces back in the 1980s. Uh, and when Ukraine received finally its independence in 1991, uh, what was done firstly to declare Ukrainian Ukrainianness? As a governmental body received new names, uh, Soviet symbols such as red flags and red stars were wiped out of the public space. Uh, the schools and university curriculums were cleared of courses on communism, and the central streets and squares of the major cities re received new names, starting from Maidan Nezalezhnosti and uh, former Lenin streets in Kiev, Lviv, uh, Odessa uh, were renamed and received new names. Um, in some cases, these streets were given back their historical names, like Rishelievska Street in Odessa or Lichakivska in Lviv, or granted new names bearing the sentiments of a modern, new created Ukraine. Uh, among these uh, Examples of the sentiments of modern Ukraine is the renaming of former Lenin Street in Kyiv that turned to be, that is now known as Bogdan Khmelnytsky Street. And Bogdan, the figure of Bogdan Khmelnytsky, the uh, 17th century leader of Ukrainian freedom uh, rebellion against uh, Polish rule, uh, was uh, selected as a national hero because. Uh, on the situation of 1991, uh, we didn't have the discourse of condemning new, the Soviet past, but a discourse of shaping the identity of a newly emerged country on the ideas of freedom, democracy, and historical heritage. And Bogdan Khmelnytsky was a manifestation of this historical heritage as far as he was a fighter for freedom of Ukraine. And in 1991, this, uh, the very fact that Ukraine finally has gained independence and a national state was seen as a culmination point in Ukrainian history. Uh, so what happened, this is uh, Maidan Nezalezhnosti Square, as it looked like in 1987 uh, during um, the celebrations of 70 years of Soviet rule. And you can see Lenin Monument here in the middle. The square then was called the uh, October Revolution Square. And uh, the monument to Lenin was uh, demolished in 1991 among the first uh, examples, first collective actions, and the square was renamed uh, to uh, Maidan Nezalezhnosti, actually. And so uh, it is also an interesting point that uh, 10 years later, after the demolition of Lenin, um, if I remember it right, in 2002, a new monument, uh, the independence monument, this column with a woman bearing a symbol of freedom was erected on the former place of Lenin. So uh, just to echo the thesis about the uh, symbolic meaning of the monuments in public spaces, that uh, such a space that is um, designed specifically to be a central square in the city, in the capital of a country, should always bear some monument that reflects uh, the important census of the uh, country. And uh, yeah, uh, the second wave of decommunization um, occurred uh, between 1999 and 2010, uh, but sometimes it is divided into two separate waves with 1999 uh, to uh, 2000 and then 2005 and 2000 till 2010, and is, is connected with the presidency and previously premiership of Viktor Yushchenko, Western-oriented politician, um, who contributed much to soft power and the issues of national biography. And among, um, during this uh, th second wave of uh, decommunization, also a range of Soviet toponyms were granted back their historical names or received new ones uh, to reflect the current political agenda or uh, to commemorate uh, prominent fighters for Ukrainian freedom or to commemorate cultural figures. And uh, um, during this time, uh, I would consider one of the biggest achievements of this a second wave of 
decommunization was uh, actually the establishing of memory politics, the establishing of a new uh, Ukrainian narrative basing not only uh, on the fact that Ukraine has finally gained uh, independence and is an independent state now, but also on re with reflections on some uneasy pages of history and uh, uh, on rethinking of the traumatic experiences of this past, especially the tragedies of the 20th century. But still on during this second wave, uh, the communization of toponyms uh, was not declared uh, as a main uh, instrument, as a main tool of uh, the communization uh, process itself and not yet a tool for establishing a national identity. Uh, and here uh, on this wave of decommunization, uh, we also faced with a ma major problem, especially regarding the renaming of toponyms, uh, that uh, it's usually the process with good intentions uh, had uh, sometimes just had no money to be conducted properly. So uh, what we get? A lack of financial support uh, subsequently led to creation of parallel spaces uh, within the cities. Uh, what do I mean here? Uh, uh, I will give an example of one of the streets in Kiev, uh, like um, we had a uh, Krasnormi uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, everything okay. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, Former Chervonarmiska Street, the Red Army Street, uh, in central part of Kiev, was renamed. It was granted back its historical name, Velika Vasilkivska. Unfortunately, sometimes a lack of financial support led to the uh, very simple situation: lack of money to change the address plates and the traffic signs. So the street was officially named, uh, received a new name. But on the traffic signs, it was still old name Chervonarmiska, and such situation persisted for 10 years. And uh, even now, I know that lots of people, uh, there are still the address plates with Krasnarmiska Street. And uh, when I personally had an office on that street and I invited some people to our office, uh, they usually asked, where are you? where your office is located? Is it Krasnarmiska Street, right? So the same street could uh, live with parallel names even though 15 years after naming has passed. And sometimes in several cases, the renamings uh, caused uh, heated discussions because there were mostly the top-down decisions uh, just based uh, on the local communities. And uh, here uh, I have, um, I'm sorry that the quality of the image is not very good, but it's a historic image from the 19th century. Uh, you may recognize it is a street uh, leading from the railway station in Kiev. If you go downhill after the, from the central railway station, you'll see this picture. This street is called now uh, Simona Petluri, but during the, uh, 150 years of its existence, it changed the names several times. It firstly, it was called Ignatievskaya. Um, after that, it received name Bezakovskaya, as you see it here in the top of the picture. Bezakovskaya after the uh, name of a railroad building in the uh, Russian Empire. After the Soviet Union, uh, Soviet rule was established in Ukraine. The street received Kominterna name, uh, was named after uh, Communistic International. Uh, during the World War II, under the NATO occupation, uh, the street was actually turned to be called Bahnhofstrasse. And after that, it became Kominterna again. And uh, in 2006, it was granted a new name, uh, Simona Petlure. It was named after a prominent uh, Ukrainian uh, state actor uh, of the events of 1970s, 1920s. And Simon Petlura was one of the leaders of Ukrainian uh, short-lived national state, national de democratic state uh, during that event, after the collapse of Russian empire and was later uh, displaced by the Soviet rule. And uh, yeah, the street was named uh, when it was some jubilee occasion of his birth date, uh, but uh, it turned to be a very heated discussion about renaming of these streets because uh, the case of Petlura is particularly interesting uh, after 
Ukrainian national state lost uh, in 1920, Petlura emigrated to France and lived in France. And there uh, in 1926, he was shot and killed by a Jewish emigre from the Russian empire. And after that, it was a quite famous case of this trial on this Jewish emigre, uh, where on the trial, he claimed that he had killed Simon Petlura because Simon Petlura uh, was responsible for Jewish pogroms during the uh, Ukrainian uh, civil war in 1970s, 1990. And uh, it received much attention and the name of Petlura was then strongly associated with the Jewish pogroms, but as as we understand, he was a leader of the state. He could, we don't know whether he was directly responsible for it. And so uh, the situation with this street received much attention as some uh, Jewish people living on this street uh, were protesting heavily after naming this street after Petlura, whose name they associate with uh, anti Semitism. And so these uh, discussions uh, happened, uh, are still happening to some extent, and people still sometimes uh, demolish the newly uh, new address plates and so on. Uh, it was just one example of how discussion, how harsh can be these discussions. And uh, so uh, we come back to the waves of decommunization and the third wave that started in 2013 with the demolition of the Lenin Monument, the picture that I showed in the beginning, and uh, is happening till now. And right now on this wave of decommunization, it is interconnected with the matters of security and national narrative and mean to reconstruct a national identity. And uh, what is the most prominent about this third wave that renamings uh, of the toponyms uh, becomes, become, became one of the main instruments of uh, this national narrative creation. And the renamings mostly, not mostly, but oftenly feature uh, and commemorate the falling in the Euromaidan events and subsequent war in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, on this, uh, only on this wave, during this wave, uh, decommunization itself was defined by specific decommunization law number 2558. Uh, however, I must say that strategies of decommunization and renaming in particular differ in the different regions of Ukraine and within the cities. Uh, and actually the wave uh, is commonly perceived connected with this law, but the law was uh, adopted in 2015 uh, as an outcome, as an aftermath of what happened with the renamings and decommunization processes before. Uh, and here, finally, during this wave, a particular memory politi polis politics appear, and special attention is finally paid to the spatial aspect of the communization. Um, and uh, to some extent, uh, one concept uh, like decommunization in public space tend to sub substitute uh, a broader concept of decommunization. And on the level of public debate, decommunization equals its spatial aspect and uh, as it is uh, at least the most visible and the most touching. And uh, here, uh, since 2015, especially after this uh, quite controversial law uh, has passed, uh, decommunization turned out to be a battlefront, a battlefront of identities and a battlefront of uh, memory politics. And sometimes um, here I have a map that appeared in the uh, text the Orgue website uh, that represents uh, the analytics of uh, how the streets were uh, named, uh, the main street, the names of the main streets in different. Uh, parts of Ukraine. And you can see on the left that uh, the main streets uh, were named after Lenin or being called Soviet Street or October Street in a majority of the cities, while uh, in a majority of the cities in all the parts of Ukraine, except for the very Western part of Ukraine. And this uh, map for me, it's one of the main examples how the communization and the street names and the topo local toponymy might be uh, interpreted uh, in a, to illustrate some points of view and some debates and how it can be, um, mm, 
how can the street names juxta juxtapose the local identities and the different regions in Ukraine? Uh, but I think it will be better to come back to this map during the discussions, um, during the discussion session. And now I will tell a little bit more about the law to 2558, uh, the so-called decommunization law that received uh, a very broad attention and is the most discussed one from the packages of the communication law that passed in that year. Uh, it was quickly claimed a memory law and accused in contradicting freedom of speech uh, because the law not only implied the um, decommunization in public space, but also uh, mentioned a lot uh, the ways of condemning uh, Soviet and NATO past yeah, Soviet and NATO regimes in Ukraine. And the law was heavily and still is heavily criticized for the lack of prior discussions uh, in Ukraine and more often even abroad. Uh, and one of the main problems uh, that this law has is a very tangled mechanism of renamings that differ for different types of toponyms. Uh, it differs so much that um, it is explains what should you do if you want to rename a street, but implies no mechanisms on renaming an oblast, a region itself. So what we have now, we have renamed cities, former Dnipropetrovsk became Dnipro, but the region is still called uh, Dnipropetrovsk region. And um, I will skip the aspect of council culture because the law is also quite often criticized for attempts to cancel the 70 years of Ukrainian history and cancel the communist past completely. And uh, it is also a point for very, um, for reflections of many academic scholars. So uh, according to this law, subjects to be renamed uh, are divided into three lists. The first A list uh, is a list of uh, people who were directly uh, connected with the crimes of Soviet regime and like Lenin, Arjanikidze, Pastyshev and so on. B list is the list of the uh, mm, abstract concepts con connected with communism like uh, Kamsam Komsomol, uh, October Revolution, and so on. And so cities and toponyms like cities names and street names uh, named after this concept should be renamed. And a C list, uh, it's an interesting story, is a list of uh, like, what should we do if uh, the street name, uh, the street is named not after the uh, person, but another city uh, named after this person. Uh, so uh, this uh, law and decommunization received much attention, but uh, still there are a lot of moments of discrepancies with uh, how did the renaming of the process of renaming the toponyms um, proceeded, and uh, there are a lot of lots of questions like do all the renamings are really driven from the law of this mentioned law actually turns out to be that not that much and what about the streets named for instance uh after russian cities this is another type of a problem that is not implied by the law but still uh requires subsequent sums from the budget and this uh like streets like Vyborgska in Kiev was renamed to other streets and so on. But it is not directly implied by the law and required by the law. Uh, also, a very lots of discussions happen uh, with the toponyms related to the Soviet army in World War II, because the law implies that uh, we should not rename the streets named after people who served in Soviet army, but were the heroes of World War II. Uh, but uh, sometimes it turns out to very heated discussions about uh, the figures of Zhukov, Vatutin, or Marina Raskova, who were accused of some crimes. And uh, we can make another lecture about these discussions going in contemporary Ukraine. And sometimes the focus in decommunizations is in decommunization is switched from the senses to the processes by the very fact that the renaming uh, oftenly uh, goes on uh, 
and presented in the media, stressing that Street A is now named Street B because person A should be condemned for collaboration with Soviet regime. And not focusing on Street A is now named Street B because uh, person B should be commemorated because of his or her actions. And in the result, what we have, uh, we have memory wars, we have monument wars, and here I echo the recent lecture by presentation by Ivan Kazachenko, who told much about this topic. And so the process got so tangled and the discussion were, got so heated that uh, such um, tents uh, where people were signing the petitions against the decommunization and against renaming the toponyms uh, were quite oftenly seen in the streets of uh, different Ukrainian city. And as you can see here, you can spot the colors and understand that uh, these actions were uh, initiated mostly by the uh, pro-Eastern, uh, pro-Russian uh, political parties. Also, another moment that is not quite is also quietly discussed regarding this law and decommunization is Ukraine is the matter of arts. Uh, what do we do with uh, Soviet era arts in public space? And uh, the memory wars we have uh, may eventually lead to a simplified formula that everything Soviet is bad, and we should cancel everything Soviet from public space. And if you try to protect anything created during the Soviet time, like public art, mosaics, or modernist architecture, you can be easily accused in uh, sympathy towards Soviet Union. And perhaps this happens because uh, the decommunization in its form like it is, it's not so, it's not focusing on rethinking the past, but renaming and uh, creating something new without this uh, moment of rethinking. And uh, now I'll come to, I will switch to the second part of my research. We'll proceed to it uh, and we'll focus more about the experiences of internally displaced people regarding decommunization. And firstly, I'll briefly talk about decommunization in Donbass region, the war affected region in Eastern Ukraine. And I would, I want to mention that decommunization in Donbass did not occur much uh, during the first waves of decommunization in Ukraine, and uh, Lenin-based and communist-based topography there in the region persisted up to 2014. And while the communization idea was suggested by the state, but not prescribed by the state, probably the local authorities may not have seen the need for it. And so uh, this is a map uh, from the uh, official website of the Ukrainian Institute for National Memory. And here you can see uh, the uh, number of uh, toponyms uh, or urbanonyms, actually the city names that should be renamed uh, by the decree of, uh, by the recommendation of Institute of National Memory. And, uh, to some extent, it might this map might be interpreted because, like any map, as uh, Mark Monmonier in his uh, brilliant book *How to Lie with the Maps* uh, mentioned, that any map can be used in any context to interpret anything. Uh, and here, uh, it is quietly visible that the southeastern part of Ukraine uh, has more names, more city names, more village names. Uh, that should be renamed more got more soviet time street cities names and sometimes even this concept was uh, used to inter like uh this part is ukraine is more soviet and less ukrainian such interpretation was also quite often but uh the region itself like why uh why so many Soviet toponyms? Because probably the region itself became heavily populated during the Soviet rule. And uh, these uh, cities' names, street names, sometimes, uh, yes, they are deeply uh, connected with uh, local identities. But uh, the very way that uh, some people may identify themselves with the Soviet era toponyms. Uh, and their local identities are based on Soviet era narratives uh, is not always an obvious um, mm, an obvious thing that a person uh, has special sentiments towards Soviet Union. Because what if uh, 
local identity might be disconnected from the Soviet leaders and concepts. And people keep identifying themselves with their home cities uh, and home streets uh, named after Soviet leaders or like with the city of Krasnopartizansk. Uh, what if person identifies herself with the city of Krasnopartizansk not as a way to honor the red partisans, but to honor own birthplace? This was a question I was thinking much about the series of interviews uh, that uh, I made with the internally displaced people uh, during my research. And actually, in my research, I um, started from the idea of what does place and space mean for internally displaced people. As uh, the very expression uh, internally displaced people has this morphological word root place in inside. And in my research, I distinguished the concepts of space and place based on the works of Yituan, Tim Cresswell. And uh, I will not, tell you much about uh, my research because it was really huge and I can tell about it for hours maybe. And so I will focus only on the decommunization related issues and explore the two dimensions of perception of decommunization by the internally displaced people like our hometown names and perceiving the urban toponyms in Kiev. And also uh, among the theoretical framework of my research, it's worth to mention is uh, Maria Levitska's concept uh, of place inherited and place discovered that was one of the cornerstones of my research. Um, Levitska introduced uh, this uh, idea that uh, place inherited and place discovered are the two types of attitudes towards place that a person might have. And uh, a single person can experience both attitudes towards different places of dwelling at different stages of life. Um, for example, by discovering the city of dwelling or inheriting a new place. And uh, for instance, a person who discovers the city in Levitska's terms might either appropriate it with a name outside the context or reappropriate it, um, well, not focus on it that much. And my initial hypothesis in this uh, short, in this part of my research was that the change of name of an inherited place would be harder to accept than the change of a discovered place names. Uh, quickly about research methodology of my research, uh, I was uh, doing the mental mapping thing. So I asked uh, the people I, I approached, the internally displaced people, to create a mental map of their home cities and uh, after um, of their home cities and tell a story about this city. Uh, each person had twenty minutes to complete the map, and after that, I uh, suggested them to make another map and to map the city of Kyiv uh, perceived by a person. And um, yeah, I focused on the methodology of uh, Kevin Leach, of Kitchen Dodge, of Jack Gizek King. Uh, and uh, for, I implied that the process of creation of a mental map appears to be a way for the informants to reconstruct their own spatial identity. And my research, I tried to prioritize the voice of displaced people themselves in order to allow them to demonstrate how certain aspects of the decommunization process contribute to the feeling of placelessness and existential outsideness that they might feel. Uh, and uh, during my research, I had 57 uh, codes of analysis in four categories. Uh, and here, uh, now I will show only one of the codes of analysis of the map, namely the good figures, the symbolic centers of the map. Uh, it is a, a very important category to analyze a mental map, like what a person uh, pays, poses into the center of the map. What is the symbolic center of the map? This idea comes from uh, Gestalt psychology. And I was surprised during my research that a lot of people created the mental maps featuring uh, the Soviet era monuments, especially in their home cities in Donbass, like this worker with a torch in uh, uh, the city of Lukansk. And you can also see the Lenin street, the central one highlighted uh, on the map. Uh, or 
Lenin monument uh, that is overlooking the city in the word of the informant. Or um, some informants also tended to um, make the monument a, not only a symbolic center of the map, but also a sense bearer, like uh, this particular informant uh, mentioned that for him, a monument can be uh, itself a symbol of a city. So in, on his map of Donetsk, uh, such symbol is uh, a monument to a miner, while in Kiev, it's a monument to Bogdan Khmelnytsky. But uh, what I was uh, thrilled about the most was this particular map that was created by a uh, informant who moved from a small industrial town in Donbass with population less than uh, 20,000 uh, inhabitants. So I will not uh, say the name of this city. And she mentioned during uh, the interview and during the mapping uh, that for her, her personal perception of her home city is divided between 2013 and uh, the present time. The map was created in 2019. Like in 2013, before the war, everything was good. And then uh, a symbolic river is dividing her past and her present. Then everything turned evil. Uh, then the city was occupied. And uh, you can see the difference in the in the colors, in the symbols she uses. And uh, she mentioned that um, she strongly associates uh, the Soviet era name of her home city with what was good for her, because these were her pleasant memories from her past. While the new name, uh, her city was renamed in 2016, uh, so the new name of her hometown for she looks like this, even though this name, uh, like, is not Soviet anymore, but for her, it's all about destruction and bad memories. And so what she mentioned uh, that every time I come back home, I feel it more complicated to feel myself bounded to this place and to my memories, even though the memories are strong and warming. My town simply does not exist anymore. And also she added that uh, when one asks me where I come from, I make a post. Should I say the true name of my town or one might think I have a sentiment on the Soviet or tell the socially acceptable name and try to explain what my town is. The same goes for filling in the documents. I am still not used to the fact that my town never appears in any of the maps or drop down lists. So she basically uh, feels herself disconnected from her past. And as my other research shows, uh, that this uh, the very feeling of uh, being connected to something, to some metaphorical concept of home, is utterly important for the internally displaced people. Uh, in other cases uh, of uh, this informant, Elizaveta, uh, mm, she comes from the industrial city of Krasny Luch in Luhansk region, and she kept labeling her city as Krasny Luch. And she mentioned to me that she always, in her memories, she refers to this city as Krasny Luch and never as a Krustalny, a new name that was introduced in 2016. And uh, here is a quote. My town is called Krasny Luch, and this name will stay with it forever, at least for me. Even if renaming is required, it could be done thoughtfully, not like a one-size-fits-all model. Because she explained that uh, the history behind this toponym, the Krasny, Krasny Luch city, that literally means the red ray, is not uh, that much connected with the Sovietness because uh, according to the local uh, city narrative, the, the town got its name uh, because of the uh, red rays that the miners see on a dawn uh, coming up, the, yeah, the rays of sunset they see when they come up from the night shift in the coal mine. So uh, the red ray is a symbol of a new day and hope and has nothing to be connected with the Soviet Union. At least it was a local narrative that she and uh, other one respondent uh, informant told me about this renaming. So she told that uh, it was a very uh, top-down decision and the new name was headed 
up to the city, even though it remains on the occupied territories. And so it is not uh, accepted by people coming from there. Uh, However, the experiences of internally displaced people dealing with uh, street renamings uh, is, can be quite uh, um, interesting. This uh, is a map created by uh, Vasil, an internally displaced person from Donetsk. And he told about the city while mapping and while telling his experiences. Uh, he mentioned that he grew up in a uh, Petrovsky district of Donetsk and lived uh, before the war on the Petrovsky street. And Petrovsky was a uh, so also a Soviet, one of the Soviet leaders uh, responsible for um, tragic events of Ukrainian past. And also he mentioned the Lenin Square. And uh, he mentioned this with uh, condemnation, like uh, it is not okay that I was growing up on a street named after a men accused in signing uh, in mass repression during Stalin era. However, while mapping uh, his Kyiv, uh, he mentions that uh, he is currently working and having an office on Stepan Bandera Avenue. Uh, it's also one of the streets in Kyiv that uh, had the heated discussions about the renaming former Moskovsky Moscow Avenue turned received the name of Stepan Bandera, chief of Ukrainian insurgent uh, army. Uh, however, you can see here on the map that he labels the avenue with a new street name, Stepan Banderi. However, beneath here there is a sorry, uh, there is a mention of Petrovka. It is a uh, an old name uh, of the subway station in that uh, neighborhood, also named after the same Petrovsky, probably, but. Long story. So he mentions, uh, I grew up at Petrovka district in Donetsk, and now I work in Petrovka district in Kyiv. A nice parallel, isn't it? Despite the area already should be named as Pachina, I use the name Petrovka as it reminds me of my lost home. However, the experiences of internally displaced people uh, perceiving uh, the street names in Kyiv might be quite tangled because as uh, one of the informant mentioned, uh, it may be quite challenging for people to uh, adapt and adjust to new street names, even in Kyiv, because they, uh, here is a quote. When the streets and avenues I used to navigate were named, I felt myself a lost person again. Just the same feeling as I had when I just moved to Kyiv. One day I was staring on a bus with a new avenue name in front, trying to guess where whether it was mine. And she also... Uh, mentions uses the old street names before the renaming because uh, these were the names of the streets and avenues that she uh, appropriated uh, as a while discovering key when she just came to the city in 2014. So it was quite hard for her to reappropriate the space with the new place names. And uh, so to sum up this idea uh, of uh, the of identities of internally displaced people, we might say that the communization somehow renaming of their toponyms uh, somehow contribute to their feeling of outsider or a stranger, as well as hometowns might also become placeless due to destructions, changes, and renamings. And this all contributes to a uh, formation of so-called placeless identities among the displaced people. And so I'll move to the conclusions of my presentations. And firstly, uh, we'll mention uh, that. Um, oh, sorry, wrong slide. Uh, that decommunization in Ukraine must might be seen as having two major problems. And first of all, of these problems, I will call uh, the ideologization or re-ideologization. And uh, uh, the problem uh, is in what the process that was supposed to develop community-based solution turned out to be a set of top-down decisions. And such an approach led to frustration and the feeling by the locals that their views were being disregarded. Uh, and to some extent, this process can be perceived as a threat to the local collective identity of a community or its past, as it delegitimizes both the history of a place and the traces of memory about the place. And uh, 
by now, the situation that we have in our society now, the very fact of using one or another name for a street or an avenue can be grounds for speculations about the political position of a person and cause uh, unwelcome debates. And uh, so finally, what could be done with all this situation? What can we do to improve the process of decommunization? While decommunization might, that might be seen from a decolonial perspective is a way to establish a new narrative and new national identity in Ukraine, but the ways, the forms, the process takes right now, especially with regard to the street names and city names is quite uh, contradicted at the moment. So uh, three ideas what could be done to improve the decommunization process. And firstly, uh, apply community-based solutions, even on the occupied territories. Um, and in case of internally displaced people coming from occupied territories, uh, mm, some community-based solutions can be made probably among the internal communities of internally displaced people coming from some city or so uh, as a proof uh, that the occupied parts of Donbass still belong to the Ukrainian cultural field and that the voice of people from there can be heard. Uh, also, uh, yeah, I didn't mention this much, that uh, the, uh, one of the possible strategies is de-ideologization and getting rid of ideologically marked toponyms itself into more neutral toponyms and also looking at world's best practices and this idea of using uh, not ideological toponyms but toponyms more connected to local geography and local history uh, was even once approved in Ukraine as a case of a Bortnichi, a suburban city in near Kiev uh, the name of this um, uh, village is Bortnichi, literally meaning, uh, meaning uh, beekeepers. So it was the idea from the local community to change all the street names that were named after Lenin, uh, October Revolution, and other Soviet census, uh, to change it to anything connected with bees and flowers, like Flower Street, Bee Street, uh, Rose Tree Street, Rosebud Street, and so on. But this idea suggested by the local community was um, presented in the media ironically. Ironically, that like, ah, uh, ha ha, funny people, they want, uh, they see the streets not as a battlefront and not as a way to establish certain narration and uh, comm commemorative practice. And so it received uh, not uh, a lot of critical attention. However, it is a quite popular international practice uh, to uh, switch to more neutral uh, street names and toponyms. And one of the positive examples and the world best practices can be a case of Görlitz Gozelit city. It's a small borderline city in, on a borderline between Germany and Poland that had a very dramatic history during the centuries and especially 20th century. So it is a town uh, located on a river and the river divides it uh, at the moment to Polish and German part. And it was a long, long story uh, about the renamings uh, and the uh, connection of identities to the street names and toponyms that uh, finally finished uh, with the opening of the borders of uh, European Union by uh, a mutual decision to create a united uh, um, city with a united community and one of the important mechanisms of establishing this new identity of the city uh, was the idea to get rid of the ideologically marked toponyms uh, to something more neutral for everyone, uh, both Germans and Poles, feeling uh, welcomed and uh, reconciled in both parts of the city. And some insights from this example we might use also in Ukraine. And so the final slide, uh, to sum up, uh, the described perspective of internally displaced people shows that the process uh, might be quite moving to people who have a greater sensitivity towards the change of national narrative. And while the idea of changing the old ideological wrong national narrative to a new one seems to have an empowering anti-colonial agenda, the whole tendency to cancel the past completely, as well as someone's identity, seems to be in 
seems to be uneasy. And perhaps the decommunization process in Ukraine could create a daily ideologization of space and be based on dialogue and bottom-up initiatives in addition to legislative norms in order to include the opinions of people who are claiming urban space on a daily basis. So this is it. It was the final slide. I see that I a little bit exceeded the time of my presentation. Uh, I'm a bit sorry because uh, I was having to too much thoughts to share and uh, having a floor to share my thoughts is always very exciting. And I hope uh, that I didn't uh, miss important points and anyway, we can come back to any of the slides during the discussion and uh, go deeper into some things. Thank you very much for your attention.